So, uh, final uh, presentation of the day, final presentation. Uh, don't forget the feedback forms, please. Uh, they're available in English or German, and uh, we'd like one from everyone, please. Uh, so, uh, this is the final presentation, and um, interesting title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Over okay, to it's up to me now. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, welcome everyone to my presentation. Uh, the, my name is here, but my name is Maciej Dobrzański. Uh, I came from Krakow in Poland, uh, where I live. Uh, I, what I do, I do MySQL and WebStack per performance consulting as my job. I used to be with Percona, but I'm not anymore. I'm doing this myself now. I also do some blogging on MySQL on this new blog, dbasquare.com. Uh, you can find it through my uh, Planet MySQL as well. Uh, so, going back to the presentation itself, uh, the grass is always greener on the other side. Um, let's focus on that one. So, what does it actually mean? Uh, let's begin by sort of defining the phrase. So, uh, it's an expression that defines uh, sort of feeling of desire about something. Uh, and something that somebody considers better than what he or she currently has or currently um, uh, or, or the situation that, uh, that he or she is currently in. Um, at the same time, uh, that alternative isn't really known that much. So uh, the alternative may not really be better. It just seems that way, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so like it's a natural feel feeling in many areas of life. You can have a phone, uh, a lame phone like mine, Samsung, and it runs on some strange OS Samsung developed, but then it's okay, right? It's all aluminum, non-breakable glass, uh, uh, no plastic in it, uh, works fast, it's, it's, it's great. Uh, but it has one drawback, it doesn't have too many applications. So sometimes I would think, you know, why shouldn't I get, get an iPhone or maybe an Android phone that would give me all these applications that are available for, the, for, the, for these platforms. But then is spending like three or four times more on the phone worth two or three more applications that I can install? That's sort of the dilemma that uh, happens when you uh, desire something, but not really, you're not really sure whether it will be better for you or not. Uh, one part of, the, um, <clears throat> um, part of the problem here is that the desire uh, on, the, on, the, on the other thing uh, means often that you have no experience at all with that other that alternative, or you have very limited experience, like you've seen it so you've seen someone using a phone, or you've seen it on the internet, or you heard somewhere, but you haven't really owned that phone, or you haven't really done that yourself. So you have no experience. You, won't, you don't know what's going to be like. So let's, it, let's relate it to operations, which is why, are we, why we are all here. Um, so in operations, this could be making a change without really thinking about all the consequences, all the uh, input uh, that is related to the decision. So it's kind of working on an impulse, like let's do it this way, but not really thinking how it's going to be or why are we actually doing this. Does it make sense or maybe it doesn't make sense? Uh, so agile development sort of encourages this because you want to deliver, you want to deploy, you want to get things done relatively quickly without doing entire waterfall, uh, without doing all the long process that may eventually kind of catch the problem. You want to fix problems as they appear. So that kind of encourages making such decisions without really thinking uh, thinking them through. But 
Agile doesn't mean careless, so you shouldn't really be doing something that you don't know what consequences it may get. Uh, you should be really doing things to get the result, but not doing things in a stupid way. But still, people do that. People happen to do silly things with their systems, with their applications that turn against them. And why? Well, I've listed a few reasons for that, for that behavior. And I'll try to cover, uh, cover them. Obviously, these are not all of them, probably. There may be a lot more, but, uh, but these are the ones that I meet the most when I help people solve various problems. Uh, as I said, uh, being agile, uh, I mean, doing agile development encourages uh, some c cutting, cutting some corners. So, um, sorry, yeah. So, uh, and also it encourages using new things to get things done. Like, you have to uh, implement certain feature, so you basically look for technologies that may possibly be the most reasonable for that. For that, uh, they may be new technologies that nobody is really using yet, or that has already have just uh, started being popular. So, like the cool things that occasionally kind of come up, and everyone starts talking about them. So, what is cool? Well, you could say agile is cool. It's like what people like to do. Uh, but over the recent years, there have been a number of technologies that could be considered cool in a way. So, cluster. Uh, that's more traditional, not very new, but um, it's a, everyone likes to have a cluster. Everyone likes to have something that does most of the work for them, that scales for them, that partitions data for them, that fails over for them, that uh, uh, basically does all the dirty work. You can just focus on the, doing the code or, or, or uh, building the application, essentially. You don't care about the stuff that is uh, down below. You hope that the software that comes uh, to do the clustering job will do that for you. So the example was uh, MySQL cluster technology. When MySQL bought the technology from Ericsson and started marketing it, after that, a lot of people started you know, asking, well, maybe I should well, start using uh, MySQL cluster to solve my problems. Well, it, it has shared nothing architecture. It has five nines uptime and what not. So why not? But uh, this is not for everyone. This isn't a, a, a general purpose database. But people didn't look at it that way. They just looked at, this is cluster, this is cool, I want that. Virtualization is another, another such uh, subject that some people consider like this is a thing. Of course, it has its uses. But there are situations where you cannot really use it. You can virtualize some systems. Some systems do not really make sense if they are virtualized. But still, there will be people who will, for example, they will uh, virtualize database servers just for the sake of running virtual instances. Well, of, of course, if they have a powerful like IBM P6 or P7, maybe that makes sense. But otherwise, why not using all 12 or 6 or 8 cores for just for the database rather than partitioning it further across several instances. Uh, well, the cloud, the public cloud especially, this is a big buzzword. And obviously, at, well, it's still part of um, what's going on that everyone wants to be on the cloud because it's easy, because it's, everything is done for you. Uh, no SQL, well, this, is, it, this doesn't need explanation, really. It's uh, probably the biggest buzzword of the recent two years. Uh, let's ditch the SQL, let's do it in no SQL, let's forget the structures, let's do, like, no, sorry. 
it. Yeah, maybe I should get an iPhone. Uh, so, <laughs> um, yeah. So this was the other other such technology that is cool and people just jump on it without really thinking about the consequences. Um, framework, it's more from development point of view. There are frameworks available for a variety of languages that just simplify uh, development. You don't have to worry about so many things. You just start writing the application logic. You just uh, develop application much faster, but this may not be something that uh, works for your application in particular, or it has it may have some other draw, drawbacks, but still people don't really care, don't really look at it at least this way. Let's let's take Rails, and application will be ready in like a week. That's all that they care about. So I have a story, uh, one of a few that I have for this presentation. Uh, this is based on these stories are based on on um, uh, situations that I met over the past few years. So the first story is about a startup company. Well, not so startup, but young company. They wanted to scale. They had their servers, and uh, they expected growth. So they wanted to be pre prepared for that growth. So well, uh, this was the thing. They moved to EC2 because it was cool and 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 fun, and it allowed them to launch the new thing, new instances very quickly. And um, well, they thought they would allow them to scale because they attached scale to running more servers. If I need more computing power, then I just add servers, and that, that's the way I scale. But well, there are things you cannot scale this way, not in an easy way at least. So after a while, yes, they could add more web servers, but then they still had the single database that wouldn't really scale at EC2. There were so many problems with it, and they couldn't really figure it out what to do with, with, with that. Uh, they typical problems like why my database needs like 50 milliseconds to read something off the disk. Uh, this, this doesn't help queries. Uh, how to implement load balancing on EC2? Uh, you, can, you can have multiple solutions available for dedicated servers you can implement easily because you control the network, you control the hardware, you can do all sorts of stuff with it. So how to do that on EC2? Well, so obviously they started doing things on the software level, like on the web servers. They started uh, directing connections. They started uh, detecting if, probable, if, the, if the server is dead or not um, to make it work. But still, it's not an easy task. It's not something that works really great. And then, of course, uh, they had so a few servers running 24-7, and then they had 10 instances running 24-7, so pay only for what you use, which is used for marketing cloud services, doesn't really work there. It's a subscription service which costs, and costs a lot, compared to hardware that you purchase and pay it like, pay for the hardware once per three years, for example. Obviously, this is not an easy comparison. I use, I use, I use a simplification, but uh, still, their bill was quite high after, after migrating to, to EC2. So they didn't really think that, I think they threw before before doing this. They just, we want to scale, well, the cloud is to scale, to help you scale, to help you manage resources. But no, cloud is better, it's, it's not better, it's different. You have to know why, in what ways it is different to be able to use it efficiently for your project. So they did what was cool, but not what was right for their particular application. So another reason why people do stupid things sometimes is lack of expertise. Uh, this is um, well, kind of obvious one, right? If you don't know something, then uh, you can get in a lot of trouble. So um, in such cases, if you don't know something, well, you need to you need to get help. Either you get an expert or hire an expert that does 
and that tells you what to do or how to do it or does it for you, or you start Googling. You start Googling, you start browsing forums, blogs, and basically get help from community, go attend conferences, get help from community to find possibilities for making your system, your application better. The pieces that you don't know, uh, you try to find elsewhere. So, as I said, you read blog, you read forums, you Google, you listen to people talking <laughs> at conferences, uh, and eventually you start using that somehow to improve the application, improve the service. Uh, the problem is that uh, whatever you find or whatever you hear, it may be very nice, it may be well packaged, very nice packaged, it may look very appealing, right? So it may make sense, like I really need this, I read, I read this suggestion and I really need that. That, that, is, that is me. I want to implement that. But if you're not, you don't have experience, or if you don't have expertise, how do you value, how do you, how do you know what you've read or what you heard is true? How do you know it works for you, in, for your par particular case? Well, you don't. So you just hope that this is right and kind of lie to yourself that it is. Uh, Often, you will have to learn uh, whether it is true or not in production. Uh, often, you will not have opportunity to test these advices properly, or they will work in the development environment, but they will completely fail once they receive a proper traffic, proper real traffic. So, if you don't have expertise, then there is uh, there is a lot of problems that may be that may be coming, and you may even un unwillingly made bad decisions, choosing something uh, that seems better, but doesn't necessarily is. Um, so the next uh, reason is lack of information. And this is somewhat related to what my colleague Kenny talked about this morning. Uh, if you don't have any information, how do you know whether your system or application is working correctly? whether you, it is working efficiently, whether it performs okay or maybe performs badly. You don't know that. You have no insight into system. So, once, once it turns out, uh, once it turns out there is no information you can get about the system, there is very little you can do to improve it. So you start the guesswork, but that's uh, determining whether a system I don't know, or application performs good or bad. This is like only something that you need to uh, check occasionally because it doesn't change uh, that often, if unless traffic increases or something. So the worst case is that if you don't have an insight, then even if you change something, you have no idea whether the change improved anything or whether, that, whether it made it worse. So you have no means for comparison before and after. Uh, also, if you don't have information about a system, when you have a problem, there is no way you can find it or it is very difficult to look for problems. You know there is something not right, you know that users complain, you know that something is running slowly, but you have no idea why, and you have no means of pointing a finger, this is the problem. You can only, again, you can only guess, uh, which rarely is very accurate. So another story is related to this problem. So this is quite common, right? So. People have a problem with performance and they call or they uh, create a ticket or they uh, ask, simply ask for help. And so these guys had a uh, performance problems with database and they didn't know what to do, so well, they upgraded the, the hardware because, well, database is running slow, so we just upgrade hardware and it should help, right? Because um, if it's performance problem, then it should help. But what problems? What problems were they trying to solve? So when I ask for graph uh, or some metrics about the system, 
all the often the answer is that we have none, but sometimes they do have. So um, let's say have the, they have application performance metrics graph like this, and then so what problems do you, during peak time do you have actually? So they send this graph and and say, well, look. During peak, there is something that happens that causes database uh, that, that causes our code to spend a lot of time in database, like 300, 400 milliseconds instead of 30. Uh, but do you have? Uh, but but is it is it is it any proof that database was being overloaded? Is it is 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 um, this time? pointing that database is not capable of running more and more queries or running them faster and faster. Well, well, no. Obviously not, because the fact that the code spends more time in the database doesn't mean the database is overloaded. So the next question is, do you have any more graphs about your system? And again, often the answer is no. Or, um, yes, we have CPU, disk space, and how many users are logged in in the system at any given time, which is what Cacti installs by default, if I remember correctly. Uh, so once you deal with that, you get really a good insight into the system. You get tons of graphs. You get hundreds, even hundreds of graphs per, per server. So then you can start uh, looking at them one by one, looking for, for changes, problems, anomalies. But the important part is that you have, if you have um, information about uh, application, about how application suffers because of the problems, if you have a dev information, how they affect business side, like the application performance metrics, uh, if you have that, then you can use the information that is easily uh, readable by anyone because it's easy to see that a code started uh, spending a lot of time in, inside database. You can start using that to correlate these two periods and, and to correlate information from, from various graphs to find kind of common, common things to isolate problems. So once you can start doing that, you can start digging. So in this case, uh, it turned out that uh, the increased time uh, that applications spend in database was related to, possibly related to um, how many active and locked transactions there were in MySQL. So we can start following that. We can use this trace as um, uh, something that will get us to the, to, the, to the correct answer, what the problem is. So once we get that, we can start monitoring certain aspects, and then we can see that, well, the reason why these all transactions pile up is that there are some transactions that lock a lot of rows, like a few thousand rows, and then they sleep for three minutes or longer. Um, so we are kind of close to the answer because if we see this one, that means that um, we understand that the problem isn't related to how MySQL, how quickly MySQL executes queries. It's not a hardware problem that that happens. It's a problem um, with application. It's a problem with application that executes a query that locks a lot of rows and then just sleeps and does nothing. It keeps the locks, it keeps the rows locked. So any other queries from, from other requests may not, uh, may not update the same, may not modify the same rows. So they start waiting on logs. And this is what the application performance graph shows. That, uh, that queries spend that much time because they wait on logs. It doesn't show that, that the server was overloaded. So it turns out that what they tried to fix with hardware wasn't a hardware or database problem at all. It was application problem. Uh, and 
they didn't have information at first. They had just they had just application performance metrics graph, so they could only see how long time for how long uh, an application would have to wait for database to respond. This this is all they knew, and looking on every other piece of information could only reveal that the problem was somewhere else. So for a long time, when they tried to solve the problem, they were basically looking for it in uh, wrong places. They were trying to solve something completely different. Something com uh, they, they were trying to solve a completely different problem. So another uh, aspect of making uh, uh, strange decisions sometimes is uh, being too focused. Uh, so if you're to f if you're focused on solving only one thing, then sometimes you start changing a lot just to make this one thing work, but you start ignoring everything else. So you stop seeing the bigger picture. You stop seeing how your investigation and your uh, conclusions may affect everything else. So another story, uh, it's from uh, an application, a social application. As such, they tend to have a lot of um, uh, a lot of information about friends and relationships between friends, which is fairly difficult to query uh, efficiently as your searches can get more complex and complex uh, in MySQL especially. Um, these queries are either slow or you cannot really do it at all in the way that you would normally want to do it. So they, had, they were having some problems with a few queries related to uh, to, to uh, finding or counting friends of your friends, uh, and and couldn't really, you know, they, they were trying to optimize queries, but uh, nothing seemed to work really. So what they thought is that well, MySQL is a better technology for this then, because well, we indexed everything, we wrote the queries right, but it doesn't work. So of course, Postgres is better because. It does better with uh, complex queries. It does better with. Uh, <laughs> it has more features that allow you to to do uh, many different types of queries that are impossible in MySQL even, uh, and do it relatively efficiently. Probably, I'm not that Postgres expert, so I cannot comment. But this is what happened. So they ported everything, the application, to work with Postgres to fix those uh, to fix those queries that were slow. To fix that, to, to make the feature work. So, the problem they faced then was that they had enough traffic that they needed a few replicas to pull pull the reads from. They need to they need to uh, scale the reads across several databases. And so, with Postgres at the time, uh, it became a problem. They didn't, which they didn't see initially. They couldn't easily and and well well enough. Uh, Set up several replicas to serve the traffic to to uh, uh, to to load balance the read traffic between the several instances because at the time uh, there was no built-in support for replication in Postgres. There were third-party solutions, which, if MySQL replication is only good, then that was below that. So, uh, so by solving one problem, they got a huge amount of completely different problems. Uh, they just didn't, didn't look at the bigger picture there. So they gained some performance, but they sort of lost something that was equally important. MySQL for them, easy scale out for reads. Well, with Postgres, it wasn't really that easy. So what they didn't do was taking a step back and looking at the problem in a different way. So. Instead of uh, changing the entire technology to uh, something else, instead of replacing MySQL with Postgres to solve the problem, why not just try to figure out how to change the feature itself to make it work with what they have? So maybe some caching, maybe some uh, uh, things like uh, like for counters, like approximation, approximating the, the results. Nobody know. Nobody has to know how many somebody, how many f friends of friends had somebody have. 
Um, so they didn't do that. They just they just decided that we are having problem with this specific thing, and we we try to solve this specific thing rather than um, solve the problem. So the next uh, next reason for poor decisions is poor communication. And well, this is obvious. Uh, uh, people from different worlds do not like to really talk to each other, especially when it's work-related. Uh, more likely, they like to argue rather than talk, so it's not easy. Uh, but this is just one level. Another level can be very different uh, if management makes the decisions about uh, the technology that uh, they will be using and this doesn't work with the people below, then uh, the result might not be very great. So another story is about a pretty large company, uh, you could call it enterprise. Uh, oops, sorry. So they were run. They are. They were running a large email service, not like Google kind of scale, but still large. Um, so they needed like 150 or so database servers to to store to keep my uh, to hate, to keep email headers, which then they could you know run queries against, so users could see their inbox contents and filter on it and whatnot. So. These servers were like pretty standard boxes, like you know, eight disks um, in a right ten, some number of CPUs, uh, enough memory to keep the working set in, inside the memory, so there's no um, too much reading. But well, still they had a lot of a lot of emails coming in, so their write traffic was pretty significant. Um, but at some point, a salesman called the management and offered them a good deal on a super cool storage device that will solve all their storage problems. Uh, and then they can basically replace it, replace all the disks and all the servers with that storage. Just, you just have to connect and it works. So the management obviously uh, didn't complain about such strategy because, well, if I can have a single box and, and it works for every servers that I have, then great. Um, so they purchased this expensive uh, storage uh, and installed it. They started uh, implementing this on servers, putting fiber channel cards into the servers and migrating the instances to use the new storage rather than local, the, the directly attached disks. So this didn't end up very well because unlike local storage, the Sun has a little bit greater distance between the uh, CPU and, and the actual storage. So the time uh, of the I.O. request is a little bit longer. So that I.O. latency basically killed their performance. The servers stopped working efficiently enough to support the traffic they had. So they had to <laughs> they had to roll it back and get back to the uh, get back to the uh, directly attached storage the disks they had. Uh, luckily, the the storage could be used for another purpose, but this didn't work out as promised. And the, re and the problem was because nobody asked for opinion. The management just decided, oh, okay, we fancy this solution. It's cool. It's uh, it, it solves our needs. It, it, it's, it fits our needs. So we just we just buy it, and there was no uh, no uh, communication between the management and the IT database people whether this is really what is what is necessary, whether this this makes any sense. Uh, so finally. Um, File savings is another reason why you may sometimes do uh, a, a, an unwise decision of choosing one technology over, over another. Um, I mentioned EC2 as an example that sometimes uh, using that as a, on a subscription basis doesn't really 
make sense financially that you do not, do not initially see, but that later turns out that the EC2 becomes a lot more expensive than, than the hardware that you own, uh, and even if you have to replace it every two or three years. But I have another story for that. So, um, sometime last year I was doing a project for a media company that wanted online presence, like run news sites and um, TV show web landing pages like you know, X Factor and whatnot. Uh, they wanted to install them, install this on it in a new new servers, new data center, new applications, everything. So I was designing the uh, uh, infrastructure architecture for them. So they gave me numbers and. I came up with, you know, you need this many servers of this or that specification that will fit in four racks. So, um, these were enterprise people, obviously, so uh, talking about uh, getting there wasn't easy enough, but eventually they demanded that they want to reduce rack space. They want three racks, not four, because the one rack costs them like 2,000 euros per month, uh, so they can save that money, and they know even how to do it. They were enterprise, so they knew all the big players in hardware, the, uh, hardware uh, uh, supply. Uh, so they, I'm sure they had a lot of offers already. Um, so they decided on using Blade system for web servers. Um, Blades, well, they take a little bit less space than traditional uh, rackable uh, systems. So they wanted that. So they had like these 30 boxes that were possible to convert into Blades. Uh, mostly web servers, and they they got two enclosures, and they split those all those servers into these two enclosures evenly, more or less. These were web servers, cache ser reverse proxy servers. These were memcache servers, small boxes that could be fit into uh, into a blade. Obviously, uh, they wanted database servers as well, but I said no, so we ended up on just small boxes. Um, <laughs> so. What they didn't think about is that if one of these enclosures fails at any time, they just lose half capacity. Uh, I try to explain that if you have 200 servers as blades, if one enclosure fails, you may not really feel that, but with two, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But they were convinced, you know, that these days, these solutions offer 100% uptime, full redundancy, and everything else. Once the, the hardware arrived, it turned out that if they want to upgrade firmware, it takes like 10 to 15 minutes to reboot everything. So they idea, their ideal world collapsed. But this is what they thought. They wanted to save money uh, without really understanding, or well, without even wanting to understand the consequences. So they chose this solution because it was getting them savings of 2,000 euros per month. So this is a complete set of those nasty things that sometimes um, make people do things they shouldn't be doing to make their bad choices. Um, and obviously, it doesn't. It isn't like that. That you just should stick to one technology and never change because it's, it's wrong. Sometimes you have to change. You have to make a change. You have to change uh, MySQL for Postgres. You change, change Oracle for MySQL. You have to change uh, Linux for FreeBSD. You have to change your storage for Sun. And there are various circumstances that, um, that may influence that. So you should uh, spend some time before making these decisions and evaluate whether what you want is actually what you want, or is it just uh, something that uh, seems nice, but whether it will work or not, uh, it's, it's really unknown. So some factors to consider are skills. This is important. What can your team do, actually? If you choose to replace MySQL with Postgres, but does your team 
know Postgres? Does, does they know how to use it? Does it know uh, how to implement it? What are its strong, or strong, uh, strong sides or weaknesses? If they don't, then does it make any sense to migrate to Postgres? You will be getting into more and more trouble as you do. So skills are, evaluating skills are, uh, is essential. If you have skills, or if you are willing to spend some time getting, get, getting these skills, that's obviously a possibility. But if you don't, it may be very, very expensive to, to follow that direction. Experience. So skills is just a subset of what is required because you can know uh, something, some technology, but if you have no experience, then you may be uh, doing basic mistakes. So I may know, you know how to install Postgres, how to, sorry for the database references, but it's, it's been my world for a couple of years. <laughs> so I may know how to do it, I may know how to you know, get around with Postgres, but I won't avoid basic mistakes because I have no experience with it. So uh, examining what experience in a given technology your team has is also important because this may save you a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of time on 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 fixing problems that you did that you did simply not knowing uh, how things should be done. Um, so fitness for purpose. Uh, so the question here is, do you really need it? So like uh, with the example uh, with a sun device, did did they really need it? No because they were running fine on what they had. They could add more boxes and scale and there wasn't a problem. It's just somebody figure out, uh, we want this. And, uh, and, and so they probably never answered the question, do we really need it? Real cost, obviously, is important because sometimes choosing something may generate hidden cost, may, may t bring hi hidden costs that you don't even know when implementing a solution or when, when deciding on the technology. So looking for this cost, calculating this cost is also important. Um, this, won't, uh, this won't affect your product, your solution, your system. Uh, Performance-wise, but it will, it may cause you to, um, well, lose a job or get another, uh, or uh, make the company go out of business. Uh, so that's that's definitely important. And finally, well, facts. Uh, these are these are critical for any operation. Uh, by facts, I mean monitoring metrics. Um, and any information, any information about the running system that you will need in future, but you may also need when choosing a solution because you will have to understand if you're choosing a storage, if the storage meets the requirements for I/O capacity, whether you can do thousand IOPS, maybe one thousand, maybe one ten thousand IOPS, or maybe it only can do three hundred IOPS. So if you don't have metrics, if you don't know facts about the the system, you may not be able to figure out whether the next solution works for you or not. Uh, monitoring basic usage is not enough. So like I said, if I come to people and ask for graphs about this on, on their systems and they give me CPU memory, disk space, and people logged into the system through SSH, that doesn't really work. That doesn't really help. This has to be complete overview of system, its performance, its usage, basically every detail matters, every, every detail counts. Um, so what I said, you need to, you need, you need metrics, you need to have information on resources usage, on system performance, on application performance, on every single level that uh, matters to the, to, the, to the application, to the system. Um, if you omit one place, you may not be seeing something very important. Also, you should make sure that team can read the information. So obviously setting up graphs is useless if you don't know how to use them. So sometimes it makes sense to set up different graphs for different people to 
uh, present information differently. Um, for developers, it makes sense to use application metrics for graphing. For, dev, uh, for ops people, it may be more important to uh, look at the slow level graphs of, of, of various usages. But the important, is, the important part is that at some point they have to meet and they have to be able to kind of under correlate and understand the same things through even through the different graphs. So we covered various situations with, which uh, make people do to, to make decisions incorrectly. Uh, and we covered uh, basic steps to avoid such mistakes when, when making such decisions, when making changes or when deciding on changes. Uh, one thing is important. So do agile development but prepare for it well. That's, that's the message I think that should be taken from this presentation. Thank you. No questions? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. And don't forget the feedback forms. Oh, oh, a question. <coughs> Uh, maybe not so much a question, but another story. Uh, I worked for an ISP and we had a customer which was a radio broadcasting station and they had a web server and a MySQL server and sometimes they called and said, um, we need bigger machines, we need a bigger SQL server, we need a bigger Apache and, and web server, it's so slow. Um, I looked at the graphs and um, the, the accesses were stable, but the traffic on the network rose constantly. Um, they had a homegrew um, content management system and when I looked at the co code and loaded the, the start page, it, it hang in a small plugin which listed the last three songs played on the radio station. And when I looked at the code, it turned out um, they, they feed the database, the playlist table, every three, four minutes with the song mm -hmm. played and never deleted something and the programmer never heard of limit. Mm -hmm. So he did a select everything, read all the table out and displayed the last three uh, rows he got and over time they transferred like 20 megabytes each time someone mm -hmm. accessed the, uh, the home yeah. page and we added a limit three and all problems gone. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and doing, doing metrics basically, even if you don't know what the problem is, if you, if you, if you cannot help uh, fix it immediately, uh, it gives you the idea where the problem may be. So that's, that's, that's important. Um, yeah, so a story related to uh, expensive purchases is that a company once purchased uh, two big IBM Power 6 systems uh, that costs I don't know how many, how much, but probably a million bucks uh, uh, per server <laughs> or something like this. So they purchased it, and it turned out that nobody in the company know AIX, and so these boxes went un were unused for about a year or two years, just not even plugged to anything, because there was nobody who could could do anything with that. So yeah, so there are various aspects. <laughs> Of, of that. Any more questions? Um, regarding the um, application um, monitoring, um, I, I guess um, the one chart was a new relic. Yes, that um, was. Do you know any, any alternatives, maybe open source um, application monitoring tools which you would recommend? Um, I think there was one mentioned in Kenny's presentation. Uh, I don't recall the name. Uh, Basically, um, often I will see custom built uh, application metrics, uh, so I don't really recall anything else. That's that's the one that I know that is kind of popular, but otherwise, otherwise not really. Using Apache, so I think it's more flexible if you write it yourself. 
Another one like Blue Relic is App Dynamics. But yeah, I don't know if you can it yourself. I don't know. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, good. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.